Psalm 34, 1 through 7. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time now to dive into your word together. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to hear what it is that you have to say to us this morning. I pray that you would help it to be an act of praise to you, that you would help me to get out of the way so that you can speak to us through your word. Please use me, Lord, for your glory. Father, I do pray for Kyle also, as Mike did, that as he teaches our kids, that they would be getting something out of it, that they would uh, leave with something changed in their hearts and um, that they would, they would come back with a, a new just vision of living for you and pray also that you'd be with those who are leaders for their cabin times and just all the little opportunities they have to help kids to grow in you this week at camp. And we pray for their safety and for their time at camp, Lord. I also pray, Father God, for Juan Carlos in Antigua, Guatemala. I thank you, Lord, that he faithfully preaches uh, through books of the Bible, Lord. He preaches from your word, not just his own thoughts or ideas, Lord. I pray that this morning in Antigua that your people would, would hear from you through the word of God as Juan Carlos preaches. And would you also just, Lord, enable us to leave today, Lord, um, empowered by your spirit to serve you. And just thank you again for the reminder this morning to praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we're in Psalm 34, but Psalm 1 starts off by showing you negative things to avoid. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So I'm going to follow suit this morning in my sermon and start off with uh, a negative example not to follow uh, from my own life. Some years ago, my wife helped me to see something in my life that I couldn't see. Every time I went for a run, I would post about it on Facebook, like the distance, my time, maybe a photo, all the things. And she asked me something like, you know, why do you post about every run? And I got super defensive and said something like, oh, you know, I, I love seeing other people post about their runs. It encourages me to want to go out there and, and run. And I'm just trying to be encouraging to people like that. And she asked a few more questions, just gently trying to see, uh, gently trying to help me see the real reason that she saw behind me posting about every run. But honestly, I couldn't hear what she was trying to tell me. But the Lord worked on my heart, and eventually the answer did become clear. I posted about all of my runs so that I could be praised by people. I didn't even want to admit that to myself. But, you know, it was so that people could know how awesome I was, that I was getting out there for a run. So I could read the comments praising my efforts, and really I was boasting in myself and seeking praise and to praise myself. This morning, we're going to look at three exhortations from Psalm 34 from the first chunk of David's poem here. But the main thing that I want you to get out of this morning is praise the Lord. So the three exhortations are, number one, praise the Lord from verses one through three. Number two, seek the Lord from verses four through six. And number three, fear the Lord from verse seven. If we stripped this passage down to the studs, we might see something like this. We 
Praise, seek, and fear the Lord who answers, delivers, and hears us. We're going to see that there's a corporate element to this also where we are praising the Lord together. David invites us to praise the Lord together. So let's start with number one, praise the Lord. That's the nail we're going to keep hitting this morning. And I think that we're going to see too that we can praise the Lord in seeking and fearing Him. So praise the Lord, it's a familiar exhortation. Likely you've heard it before. When you read through the book of Psalms, you'll read it roughly 130 times. And when you see things being repeated in your Bible, that's a great clue to pay attention. That's one of the ways that the biblical authors and the Holy Spirit who inspired what they wrote to show us, hey, this is being highlighted for you when it's being repeated. And maybe, like me, some of you might say sometimes, praise the Lord when something's gone well, you, you get some good news or an answer to prayer. So even though this may be familiar to us, I think that we need to hear it often. Praise the Lord. And here's the thing, too. It's been my experience that we tend to praise ourselves. If some of us were being honest, we would write the first three verses like this. I will bless myself at all times. My praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in myself. Let the boastful hear and be glad. Oh, magnify me with me. And let us exalt my name together. But... For real, our hearts gravitate towards something more like that. We struggle to praise, seek, and fear the Lord even when we know He answers, delivers, and hears us. And like the gospel, I think it's a message that we should be reminded of constantly. So let's look at the text and see what this passage has to say about praising the Lord. Let's read verses 1 through 3 again together. Psalm 34, 1 through 3 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. So, how am I kind of getting the heading, praise the Lord, from all of this? I don't think it's just in verse 1. Listen to the words from this section. Bless, praise, boast in, magnify, and exalt. And they're all about the Lord. I think they're all saying, praise the Lord. Bless, to praise God. Praise, to express warm approval or admiration of. Boast in, talk with excessive pride and self-satisfaction about one's achievements, possessions, or abilities. But in this case, those of God. Magnify, to extol or praise enthusiastically. Magnify could mean glorify or praise and worship. Exalt, to hold someone in very high regard or to think or speak highly of. A.K.A. praise. So verse 1 could be, I will praise the Lord at all times. And that's actually how the New Living Translation renders that first verse. And it says, at all times. So like even when things are bad, yes. In the good times, in the bad times. And I think it's really natural for us to think about how hard it is to praise God in the valleys. The times where you feel the shadow of death. I think we all get that. But I want us to think this morning about the good times also. In some ways we might have more difficulty praising God in the good times. That might not be true for all of us, but for some of us, I think it is. When everything's going great, we can tend to forget about God because He is a God who we go to when we have need, but not abundance. When things are bleak, it's more likely that we're more fervent in prayer 
that we're reaching out to God and seeking Him like David wrote of in verse 4. Our Bibles tell us when David wrote this psalm at the beginning of, chap- of the chapter before verse 1, it says of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. So David was delivered from danger by feigning madness in the presence of King Achish of Gath or Abimelech. He was so scared of being captured by the enemy that he did this. 1 Samuel 21, 13. I think we have it on the slide. Thank you. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the door of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. So that's where David is at. And then he starts this psalm by writing of how he will praise the Lord. One Bible commentator wrote, David sang his song in the night of adversity. When God's people are afraid, they should worship. When they're filled with panic, it's time to praise. When worry overwhelms, the time for worship has arrived. So sometimes we praise the Lord more when things are dark. When your mom gets really sick or your child is struggling with chronic health problems, when we're desperate for him. Because in the good times, we can be like, I'm good. It's great. Everything's good. And we forget about praising God because we fail to see our need for him. And in this country, this is a snare of the devil that I think is very easy to fall into because we have it pretty good here. This is a quote from a Barna Group research study And it just says, believers in the slums of Kenya understand God's provision and sustaining presence in ways that many more affluent Christians do not. So take this exhortation from David to heart. Praise the Lord at all times. In verse 1, David also wrote, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. So not just in easy times or difficult times, but continually. So that means not just on Sunday mornings, but throughout the week. I think that in David's heart, there's a reality that is so bright and bold about who God is that it leads to David writing of his mouth continually, praising the Lord. This is not something that he wrote down as a goal to achieve. It's not something that he was taught and he's just striving for it. David has a clear understanding of who God is. And so I would describe this praise of the Lord continually being in his mouth really as a way of life for him. It was something that he talked about all the time. And that's how we praise things too. Like when there's something that you're passionate about, you keep finding yourself talking about it. Anyone who knows you would know what that is because they hear about it continually on your mouth. So, what is being praised continually in your mouth? Or who is being praised continually in your mouth? If it's not God you're missing out on the reality of just how good he is. And you might need to be reminded of what he is really like. His love for you, the deliverance that he provided for you from sin and destruction through his son, Jesus. Once you see that rightly, he will be continually on your lips. David continues these thoughts in verse 2. He wrote, My soul makes its boast in the Lord. He's not bragging about himself, but the Lord. And I think that these three verses go together. You can see, at least in my ESV, the, the way they formatted it, it's together in a chunk. But look down at them. As we bless and praise the Lord in verse 1, boasting in Him from verse 2, Magnify and exalt him from verse 3. We are humbling ourselves, we could see 
in verse 2. The humble are glad to hear the praise of the Lord. If we could bring the photo up. So I'll describe it if, if you can't see it, but okay, it's pretty big, yeah. So I think that this mud puddle is beautiful. I mean, it's just a puddle of mud, but look at it. Look at the rich colors and details, the sense of scale that you get when you see those fluffy white clouds bordering the edge of the trees and then the brilliant blue sky behind it giving you this sense of scale and grandiose wonder of, look at all that. But let's get real here, it's a puddle of mud. Puddles of mud are gross, like they're ugly, sometimes they're stinky, sometimes they have stuff underneath that's just been spoiling. I know that there are kids in here who would love to jump in a puddle of mud, but most of us would avoid it because we don't want its filth getting on us. So why do I think this puddle is so pretty? Well, because of what it is reflecting. The beautiful sky is being reflected in the dirty mud puddle, just as our souls can make their boast in the Lord. For our souls to make their boast in the Lord, we have to be humble. And when we are humble, we will hear God's praise and be glad. So in the same way that I look at myself and might describe my failings as I'm more like a mud puddle than a radiant skyline landscape. But, you know, when you see that landscape, you can boast in that. Look at God's creation. So we humble ourselves and we boast in the Lord. We don't point to ourselves, but to God. David's intention here is to bless the Lord at all times, and he invites all the humble to join him in his song of praise. David wrote in verse 3, Magnify the Lord with me. To magnify the Lord is to tell of how great he is. And um, I read through the book of Luke recently. And in there, in chapter 1, in Mary's song of praise, she said, My soul magnifies the Lord, from Luke 1.46. And a note in my Bible says, Mary's entire being is caught up in praise of God. And to me, that sounds like David in this psalm. Also notice in verse 3, David wrote, Magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. The word for together in Spanish just popped into my head. It's worse when you're trying to order food. and you're, Spanish, no, English. We're in the United States. But back to my point, exalt his name together. From verse 3, I think that this is a great invitation to all the people of God to join in praise together. It's one of those great examples in all of the Psalms. And this praising of the Lord, it's not only a solo act. As Hebrews 10.25 tells us, we do not n- neglect to meet together, but encourage one another. One way we can encourage each other is praising the Lord together, like David is inviting us to do. So, come back next week, not only to receive and get yourself filled up, but also to praise the Lord with your spiritual family here and encourage them through your worship. So that's the first and main exhortation, praise the Lord. And now we move on to number two, seek the Lord. When we seek the Lord, the text tells us that he answers, he delivers, he hears. Those are things that we can pull out from David's experience. So let's read verses 4 through 6 together. David wrote, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. David sought the Lord when he was afraid of being captured by the enemy. And in this song of praise, he's reporting that the Lord 
answered him. We do not serve a God who is far off. He didn't speak the universe into creation, grab some buttered popcorn and say, all right, let's see how this goes. Good luck. No. Throughout the history of the world and mankind, we can read even in our Bibles in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that God has been very involved. He gets involved in the lives of humans and he's a God who listens. So one way that you can seek him is through prayer. But God cannot answer you if you have not first asked him. Jesus told us that our Father knows what we need before we ask him. But then he went on to say this in Matthew 6, 9 through 11. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And it continues, but this is not a prayer that you pray once. This is give us this day our daily bread. Lord, please give me what I need today. This is language of someone seeking God daily, asking of God daily. So why does Jesus tell us to pray this way when he taught that the Father already knows what we need even before we ask him? I think that he's telling us to come to the Father for what we need, to seek the Lord. Look at verse 5. It says something about their faces being radiant and they shall never be ashamed. Why do those who look to him have radiant faces? Those who look to God are those who seek him. And their faces shall never be ashamed. What's David getting at here? I think that he had Moses in mind. The great prophet who spoke with God. If you remember the scene from Exodus 34, verse 29, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Moses' face wasn't shining because he was awesome, but because he was talking with our awesome God. One Bible commentator wrote, Radiance reflects the joy of God's revealed presence, while the sense of God's withdrawal brings the darkness of shame. In verse 6, David wrote, As a poor man he cried, and the Lord heard him. But this wasn't just about him not having money. He was on the run without resources to deliver him from his troubles. David was in a place of need, a poor man. So he cries out to God, and God delivers him. God saved David from all his troubles. If you look down in verse 4, David sought the Lord, and the Lord delivered David from all of his fears. Verse 5, those who look to the Lord are delivered from shame. Verse 6, the Lord hears and saves from troubles. And verse 7, the Lord delivers those who fear him. Okay, before I move on here, I need to talk about something. If you're listening to me this morning and you are not a Christian, I really need to tell you something. You need deliverance. Or we might, we might say salvation. And ultimate deliverance comes through Jesus. There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name by which we must be saved. Why do you need deliverance? Because your sin separates you from a relationship with God. And the wages of your sin, what you earn from your sin is eternal death apart from him. We all miss the mark of God's perfection. The Bible says all have sinned and none are righteous. We all fall short. And there's nothing that we can do to make things right with God. 
We can't fix the relationship with any amount of good works. There is no scale that we can pile good works onto to fix it. If I just do enough good stuff, no. Only through faith in Jesus can we find favor with God and forgiveness for our sins. There is no earning salvation. So, we have a problem. And so, in love, God graciously sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to come to the earth. And as a human, Jesus was tempted, but He never sinned. So when He chose to go to the cross for you, in your place, His death was a perfect sacrifice that took away all of your sins, even the really ugly ones. All of them. So that if you repent or turn from your sin and trust in Jesus and his work on the cross and follow Jesus, you will be saved. You will be delivered from the eternal destiny of suffering apart from him. But even better than that, since your relationship with God the Father will be made right through Jesus, you become adopted into the family of God as a son or daughter of the King of Kings. So now you can go to the Father. You're not righteous in your own works, but because of Jesus. You can go to the Father. You can seek Him. You can draw near to God with confidence to receive mercy and find grace to help you in time of need. That's from Hebrews 4.16. When God's children cry out to him, like David wrote in verse 6, he hears them. You can know that the creator of the universe is hearing you from reading David's experience in this psalm and that when you cry out to him, he hears you. One Bible commentator wrote, God saves the poor, the brokenhearted, and those who cry out to Him. His salvation reaches out to include those whom the world would exclude. But God wants to include in His kingdom whomever will come to Him. So seek Him. So we had number one, praise the Lord. Number two, seek the Lord. And now number three, fear the Lord. Let's read verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. And I would encourage you to read the next seven verses in this passage later on today because it continues to say a lot more about fearing the Lord and what that even looks like. But this morning, I just want us to think about this common but sometimes confusing phrase that we see a lot in our Bibles and particularly a lot in the Psalms. Fear the Lord. This is not like the other false religions with false gods that were around King David when he wrote this psalm. Other gods were to be feared because they could be cruel. They could be temperamental. You couldn't know what the gods would do, so you made sacrifices and did things out of fear of the gods. But I think that what we have here from David is just the opposite. I think that our fear or reverence comes out of the fact that we can know Him. As we seek Him, we can know Him. And I think that the more that we know Him in the way that David knew Him, the more that we will fear Him in the way that David was writing about fearing the Lord. We know God, and because of the realities of who He is, we can have great reverence for Him and will want to obey Him. Reverence or deep respect for. Earlier I said that I believe David's heart had this reality in it so bright and bold about who God is that it led to David writing that the praise of the Lord is continually in his mouth. 
And I think it's the same here. Because David sees God as he truly is, David has a deep reverence for God. He fears him because he knows how truly great and awesome the Lord is. There is none like him. He's the king of kings, the creator of the universe. And as I was thinking about this, something from my childhood came to mind. It's kind of silly, but I think it will be helpful. So when I was a kid, all my friends had fitted baseball caps. They didn't have the little adjustable straps. No, if you had a fitted hat, it was way cooler. I don't know why I don't feel that way these days. That's how it was. So back then, I got this awesome, deep forest green fitted hat. And it was of the Seattle Supersonics. And back then, in the early to mid-90s, this was their logo. Thank you. And so it's like the top of a basketball, but it also looks like a window that you're looking through to see the city of Seattle. You can see some tall uh, skyscrapers, and then a little above all of those tall skyscrapers is the Space Needle. It's the tallest. And I think for a lot of us, this is our view of God. Yeah, that's cool. There's God. He's above all the others. That's him in the skyline, the big guy up there. However, one time my family went to Seattle and I got to visit the Space Needle. And as I stood at the base of the Space Needle, it totally blew me away. Standing at the base next to what was a little vertical line in the logo on my hat, just the little structure at the bottom there, was like this huge support beam, way bigger than me, just sailing up into the sky. It seemed impossibly big. To me as a kid, to see that massive structure up close was truly like nothing I had ever seen before. And it made me feel very small. And I think this is just a glimpse of how we should see God. When we seek Him and know Him, He just blows us away. And it's surprising because He's not like anything or anyone else in the whole universe. And seeking God, coming to know the true God of the Bible, should stop us short and result in us praising the Lord at all times, praising continually, boasting in the Lord, magnifying the Lord with each other, exalting His name together, seeking the Lord who answers, who delivers and saves from fears, shame, and troubles, and in whom ultimate deliverance can be found through His Son, Jesus Christ, Seeking the Lord who hears us, and in fearing the Lord, in reverence, which leads to joyful obedience. Let's pray. Ah, thank you, Lord, for this passage, for the man David who wrote it, man after your own heart, Lord, just like us, struggled a lot with sin. He was not perfect. And Lord, I just pray that this morning you'd help us to just get a glimpse of how big you are, how real you are, how even though you are all of these things, you, che you choose to speak into our lives, to, to give us your word so that we may seek you. And that thanks to Jesus, though we are like a mud puddle, we can seek you and what we're seeing in the reflection of our soul. Lord, we thank you also for the way that through Jesus you cleanse us, like you had them cleanse the, the temple or the tabernacle in the Old Testament so that your Holy Spirit could come and dwell with them. Thank you for the mighty work you've done through Jesus to cleanse us so that your Spirit can come into us and dwell in us. That Our bodies are your temple, Lord. So, Lord, I pray that your Spirit would be at work in us this morning and all throughout our lives until we come to see you, Father. 
that we would seek you, that we would praise you continually and at all times. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.